I watched some movies this month that I never thought that I would watch. Hi guys, I hope you're doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome to What The Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. It is that time again, it is time for another monthly recap, looking back over all of the movies and the TV shows that I watched in the month of August. Now, starting off, we will look at all of the new released movies of 2024. Uh, they're mostly horror with one non-horror. Then we'll look at the rest of the movies that I watched. This includes re-watches, first-time watches, older movies, newer movies, and then finally we will have a look at the TV shows that I watched. Then all finished off with a pick of the month. This is usually where I pick one <clears throat> about five movies that I watched in the previous month that I would highly recommend to you. My, well, pick of the month. Okay, so starting off with brand new releases of 2024, and the first one we're going to look at is Alien Romulus. Um, this is the latest installment in the Alien franchise, which is directed by Feda Alvarez, and um, it stars Kaylee Spaney, is it, and David Johnson? Yeah, Kaylee Spaney and David Johnson. Um, this film, my God, is so divisive in uh, the horror community. A lot of people seem to really love it and a lot of people seem to really not like it. And while I think that it's great that a film is going to create different thoughts and feelings and, you know, it's not going to be for everybody, what does kind of annoy me quite a lot is how the people who don't like it are attacking the people who do like it. We can have different opinions, we can like different movies, that's the great thing about movies, there's all different kinds for different people. But for me, I really loved this film. I gave this four and a half out of five stars and a half, I had such a good time with this, but I was kind of predisposed, predisposed? predisposed to like it because I love the Alien franchise. It's one of my favourite franchises in horror. I had such a blast revisiting it in preparation for the release of this one. Um, I have done a full review, a full spoiler-free review of it, which I will leave a link to here. And I have done some spoiler talk on it where uh, we get more into depth about it on my Patreon page. So if you want to know my more in-depth thoughts about it, you can go and watch one of those two episodes. Generally, I, I enjoyed it. I think it was visually beautiful. And I think that you can tell that the creative team behind it have a lot of love and a lot of respect for the franchise. You know, it is a 100% practically made movie. All the special effects are practical, which I appreciate. I know a lot of other horror uh, fans do as as well but you know while there are so many positives there there were a few little bits little niggly bits with it that I didn't like I personally loved the fan service in the easter eggs I thought it was so much fun spotting them because you had really little ones like cornbread to really massive ones uh, including, you know, casting and things like that. But I think that there was one point that the movie got to where one line was said and I just thought that's cheesy pie for me. That's just a little bit too much. I've loved all the others. I didn't need that. Uh, the other thing I didn't love about it was the ending. It's just not for me. I'm happy for people who had a wild ride with it. I appreciate and respect it, but the ending was not for me. The rest of the movie, I absolutely loved. Okay, so the next brand new release for 2024 is another horror, and that is Mousetrap. <laughs> This is another one of those movies where the material has gone uh, copyright free or it's gone into the public domain and it's not Mickey Mouse, it is Steamboat Willie. This has now gone into the public domain and so we now have a horror movie on it. This is not tied in with the Winnie the Pooh, uh, Pooh Universe one. This is a completely separate one but it's in the same vein. It is taking a beloved childhood story, a childhood character, I guess, it's not stories, it's more like a cartoon, but a character and making it into a horror movie. Now, this one is a very low budget film. It has essentially one location. It's a really good location. It's a kind of like kids fun house, birthday party, you know, um, like you have your soft play area and arcades and you know, that I don't know the name for them, but they're everywhere. It's set in one of those at night and um, this group of teens are having this surprise birthday party for our lead character and in the meantime they are being stalked by this masked uh, Willy from the Willy the Steamboat driver thing, mouse thing. <laughs> 
Um, I gave this one one star. I watched this film with no expectations, not high, not low. I went into it thinking, for all I know, this could be incredible. Or it could be a really bad film, but you can see the care and effort that has been put into it, and it will probably be a fun ride. It was neither of those things. This, I didn't enjoy this at all. Uh, the beginning was intriguing, and I, I was kind of hopeful for the setup. Um, but pretty quickly as the film got going, it just wasn't for me, and it just never was able to pull it back. So, I did kind of find it funny that this film opens with Star Wars scrolling text going up and it is making it very, very clear that this is not associated with Disney or any of its affiliate companies. And it kind of makes this gag out of it and it was quite funny. Um, there are some nicely lit shots using the location. Like I said, there is one in this room where this character, he's watching a projection of Steamboat Willie. So it's really playing around with light in an interesting way. And I think that the space that they had, they could really utilize because what happens is you end up with your characters split off going into different areas. So you have some uh, with like arcade games and basketball games, some are at a bar or the the like reception desk. Some of them are off in the climbing uh, exploration area. The kills for the most part are off screen. I guess they have to be because they're low budget and they're quite boring. Um, there's also, for some reason, this this weird thing that the characters don't even seem to care that each other are dying. So I, if they don't care, why should the audience care? Uh, no one really reacts that their so-called close friendship group are being picked off, apart from our lead character. She fully breaks down and is absolutely distraught to see this one person killed who is kind of this person in her life through work like she doesn't really know this person that well um but the scene is completely lifted out of scream 2 so they're basically just copying that scene and the reaction of this character just doesn't fit the situation and doesn't fit how she's reacted when people she does care about have been killed it's it's so bizarre and there's this whole thing that this villain is a little bit like michael myers in that there's this question mark of is he supernatural or is it just a human and the the killer seems to be able to teleport trans like teleport from one place to another there's a point where they question if there are multiple killers and the people are going yeah sure this killer can teleport i mean we've got a you know someone stalking us in a mouse mask so sure they can teleport it's like those those two aren't the same that isn't the same level of bizarre. Just because a mass killer is after you doesn't mean you instantly accept uh, that they teleport. Again, it's just really bizarre. And the ending, I mean, okay, so kudos. I will, I will give them props that the ending was actually quite surprising, but it goes in this really weird comedic direction that again didn't seem to fit in with the rest of the film. I kind of had hopes that this would be a, a real surprise fun fest. It really wasn't. I gave it one star. Um, you know, check it out if you want to. Okay, but we could not be more different with the next one because the next brand new release of this year that I watched is Oddity. Oddity is incredible. It's one of, if not the best horror movie of the year for me so far. Maybe not best, but it's definitely going to be up there in the top three. I would be gobsmacked if anything can uh, knock it out of the top three spot. I gave this four and a half out of five stars and a heart. Um, so Oddity is one that I don't really want to tell you too much about because this is a film that I think you should go into blind, knowing as little as possible and just enjoy the journey. Things I will say is this is a slow paced film. Again, it's low budget. There are like maybe three different locations. There are a handful of actors. Uh, it is slow paced and slow built, but it is worth it. For the scares that you get in it, the tension that is built, the couple, like literally a couple of jump scares you get and other scary moments are all worth sticking with it. Even if you don't love slow builds, um, or slow paced films, I would really say give it a go because the scares are worth it. Um, this is a film from the opening. It immediately sets this tone of something is uneasy, something is off. And you know when you're 
you get uh, prepared for a jump or something to happen in a film and then you get that cathartic release when it happens. There are points in this film where it builds you up for it and nothing happens or maybe it does, um, but you just left in this state of looking in shadows, looking in corners, waiting for the inevitable something to happen. And it's just such a wonderful viewing experience. I would also say, um, because this is on streaming now, uh, watch it with like curtains shut or watch it at night when it's dark. A lot of the film is dark and you want to be able to see everything. So make sure you make it as dark as possible. There were two moments in this two jump scares that really got me, but there was one jump scare that got me um, that was like a delayed reaction. So the, the thing happened, you see the scary thing, but my brain took a few seconds to process that there was something off in what I'd seen. So like a few seconds go by and then I just screamed um, and jumped because it just, oh, it was just so effective. Honestly, such a good film. Definitely check it out if you can. Okay, and then the last new release horror. There is another new release film to talk about, but the last new release horror of this year is a film I never thought I would watch. I never intended to watch this, but it's Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Like I said in my review, consider me gobsmacked because this film is actually kind of decent. Compared to the first, this is all right. I gave this three out of five stars and I think I gave the original like half a star. It, it was a DNF, I didn't even finish it. It was my worst film of last year, didn't even finish it and I gave it half a star and this one I gave three stars. So this is the direct sequel to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey and it is made, directed and written by uh, Reese Freak Waterfield, is it? Yeah, Reese Freak Waterfield again and this is the second film in the big uh, like planned universe, the Pooh universe. So I think it's um, Winner the Pooh 1 and 2, and then I think it's Bambi the Reckoning, and then it's Peter Pan something or other, and then there is Pinocchio, and then there's going to be like like an equivalent of the Avengers where they all come together uh, in this bigger universe. So Winner the Pooh, Blood and Honey. First thing to mention is the look of the creatures, the animals from A Hundred Acre Wood is so much better. The masks are so much better. And then we also have the additional uh, characters of Tigger and Owl, who for me were highlights of this film. Owl is more kind of a vocal guy than an action guy, but it's so good. And then there's this scene with Tigger in it in this rave uh, warehouse, this warehouse where warehouse rave man i struggled to say that absolute highlights for me there are some fantastic lines in this uh where a character says f this let's bounce and then tigger's like that's my line um there's also this wonderful moment where Pooh and who is it is it Pooh and piglet or Pooh and owl i don't know two of the characters are playing poo sticks and they're like dropping it in the water and watching it come through from the other side of the bridge but it's body parts it's fantastic. There's this other bit where Pooh rips off this woman's arm and just beats her to death with it. So the, the kills are varied and they're still mean. Like my main issue with the first film was it was so vile and so mean-spirited. This one is still mean but a little less so and some of the kills, uh, like especially the Tigger killing people in the rave, like that gets a bit much because it's just so much at once. But at least the kills are varied, they're creative, and some of them have a little bit of humour to them as well. Another huge highlight about this one is that we have a story. There is a narrative to this film and it's actually quite interesting. It focuses on um, Christopher Robin and the creatures of 100 Acre Wood kind of been uh, jewels of each other, like mirror images of Mirror, mirror images of each other. They're both dealing with past experiences. They are all who they are because of past experiences. Christopher Robin is trying to process through it, through the trauma of the events of the first film. But we also have this introduction of another story. I won't say it because um, it is a twist reveal in it that is actually really interesting, but there's this introduction of another trauma, another event in Christopher Robin's life and it fleshes out the story, it fleshes out the uh, animals of a hundred acre wood, it fleshes out Christopher Robin, and it's, you know, it's introduced and you think, oh, why are we having this now thrown in at this late hour? But it's worth it, it's actually really interesting and quite sad. And um, yeah, you know what? It's 
it's all right. This is not the worst film of the year for me. I'm already like ranking mine on a list on Letterboxd and there are many, many films below this one. So this was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> okay, and the final brand new release for 2024 is not horror, it is Despicable Me 4. Now I gave this one two and a half stars, it's fine, it's average. I like the Despicable Me franchise, I've seen all the previous Despicable Me's and the Minion films, I think apart from one. Um, they're solid, they're good kids films, I mean whoever designed the minions it's just a marketing genius really did we need a fourth film in the franchise no is it fine to stick on a watch and have a good time i mean yeah, you know like i said it's average it's two and a half stars for me if you if you still like kids films i don't know check it out, make your own mind up. It's an eloquent review, I think you'll agree. Um, okay, so that is it for brand new releases for 2024, but now we will have a look at the rest of the movies that I watched in August. So first up we have I Know What You Did Last Summer. I watched this one for a Patreon commentary track. This is a five out of five star film for me and a heart. I love this film so much. The film itself is incredible. I love The Fisherman. I love The Fishing Town. It has one of the most incredible casts. Um, Helen Shivers is just one of the greatest female characters in horror. I just, I love this film so much. Next we have Clute. This is from 1971. Um, this stars Donald Sutherland and Jane Fonda and Roy Scheider. Uh, from Jaws. This is more of a thriller than anything. Uh, it's set in the 70s. Donald Sutherland plays this cop or this uh, investigator whose friend has gone missing and his wife uh, has asked people to investigate his disappearance because she wants him back basically. And the only person who has any information on this is Jane Fonda's character who is a part-time sex worker. She was full-time, is now part-time and trying to be a model and an actress as well. And she had this guy as a client and so she's uh, the only one with information and a witness. This is what leads Donald Southern Sutherland to her. And then the thriller, the story of it unfolds. This isn't the greatest thriller I've ever seen. And it's not the greatest 70s thriller, which is, you know, a shame because this decade is known for thrillers. However, I would highly recommend watching this. Not only does it have the legend Donald Sutherland in it, but while this film is called Clue, that is the name of Donald Sutherland's character, it is Jane Fonda's movie. It is her character's movie. She is mesmerising in it. Her performance has this continual duality of this woman who is brave and scared. Uh, she's mean and pushing people away, but she's like soft and she, she wants to let people in. She's who she is because of experiences, but wants to move past them. And she just is so sexy and, you know, sort of sexual throughout the film. And it's such an interesting portrayal of somebody as a sex worker who there's a scene that she's describing her feelings of it and how it makes her feel when she's talking to her therapist. And for the 70s, it just feels very honest. It feels very ahead of its time. I won't talk too much about the story side of it because there isn't that much to it. And you could probably figure it out after a certain point but for her performance, it is worth checking out. I gave this one four and a half stars. Uh, then I had a rewatch of The Dark Knight Rises from 2012. This is the third and final installment in the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. So the reason I watched this is because my lovely sub and Patreon friend Rin, um, on their channel, I did a 2010 decades movie draft and my selections, I was one of the winners. So uh, we then did another episode, which was film, different uh, genres of films from different decades. I'll leave a link to it down in the description box and here. Uh, it's also in my collab playlist. It was a really fun time, but uh, I re-watched this in preparation for that. <laughs> Long story short. I love this film so much. I gave this one five out of five stars and a heart. I know some people consider it the weakest in the trilogy. I don't. This is actually my personal favourite in the trilogy. Uh, this and Batman Begins, like, very close. This one just for me tips it over because of the immaculate cast. I mean, not only do we have the returning spectacular cast of the previous two, but we now have the addition of Marianne Collitard and Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, we have the return of Killian Murphy and Michael Caine and Morgan Freeman. Uh, who else do we have? Um, Gary Oldman. And it's just an incredible movie. It's just, it's that thing of it's, still gothic enough enough even though it's not like the Tim Burton ones there's still enough 
gothic darkness to it but then there's the action side of it as well it has these wonderful sequences and I just think that these films are always interesting because the villains are so complex yes you already have this incredible material source material from the comics and the graphic novels and things like that but you know in this one you have Bane whose motives are kind of understandable in a way you have this person who wants to highlight the corruption and lies within the politicians and the law enforcement also wants to highlight and change the wealth disparity between the wealth and the poor so you can kind of get on board with that and it, I think it's always more interesting when you have a villain who's complex and lives more in the grey area. Uh, this also has one of my favourite endings in a film ever. I absolutely love the musical score from Hans Zimmer in the in the end sequence and just how things are sort of wrapped up but also just deliciously left open as well. Uh, it is also wonderful to have superhero films that are self-contained. You can watch this trilogy and you don't have to watch anything before or after. You don't need to watch 20,000 movies and their mid credit scenes and all these TV series to know what's going on. It is three movies in completion with a story that is completed as well. Next we have Downton Abbey from 2019. This is the first feature film of Downton Abbey. There are two, I believe, no three now, there's the, uh, no two and a third one's coming, I beg your pardon. If you haven't seen the TV show, this is a British TV period drama set from 1912 to 1926, I think. It starts with the sinking of the Titanic and then moves through the First World War. And the films are all set in the 20s. It's very luxurious, you know, upstairs, downstairs. Um, it's a fun time. This one was all right. This one is where the King and Queen are visiting Downton Abbey. And there were moments where the pomp and ceremony was a little much, but you know, it's an escapable fun time. I gave this three out of five stars. Then I watched Captain America Civil War from 2016. This was another rewatch again for the episode. I was a big fan of Marvel. I've always preferred DC, always preferred Batman, but when I was younger, I used to love the Marvel cartoons, uh, especially like the X-Men and things like that. I love all the X-Men movies. But then when they started the MCU, I was watching them uh, sort of accidentally, not realizing the long-term plan. And as it went along and I was introduced to characters I'd never known before, like Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, I honestly didn't know these. I was more about Hulk, Spider-Man, X-Men, um, the Fantastic Four. I really loved this and I was a huge, huge fan of Captain America because of the whole history element and coming from the Second World War. I just thought that that was really good. But post Endgame, I really just fell out of love with the MCU and I haven't maintained it. I just feel like it's more about making money now than making quality and telling these really good stories. And so I rewatched this and I was kind of disappointed because I just didn't love it as much as I used to. And it was highlighted more so after watching uh, The Dark Knight Rises. So that was kind of sad. I still gave it four out of five stars though. Okay, then we have Insidious 3. Um, this again was for a Patreon commentary track. You guys know my thoughts on this. This is my favorite of the Insidious films. I love this film so much. Uh, Lee Winnell's directorial debut. I think that it's beautifully shot. He has an incredible eye for color schemes, incredible eye for camera angles. And this particular shot that he does where you have your roll of three and he has his character central and then like things symmetrical on either side. I love it. Um, in terms of characters, I think that this uh, is so uh, it's so well written because we've been following the Lamberts for two movies. We go into a new location, we have a new villain and we have a new family and instantly I think you connect with them. There's a lot of show not tell as well. We naturally get to know the dynamics of this family and also I feel like it's one of the most human ones, how it deals with mortality and illness and you know, I love the side characters. It's like this, I think is she like the crazy bird lady or crazy cat lady, her and her husband. I just, I love how those characters are written. And there's a line of dialogue in this film that makes me cry every single time. It just, it has so much heart to it. It's, you know, in terms of scares, yeah, there's one too many jump scares and all that kind of thing, but I, I love the human element of it. So I give this, Four and a half stars out of five and a half. I love it. Uh, okay, then I did a rewatch of The First Omen. 
this is from this year. This is the second time I watched it. Luckily, I got to see it on the big screen. Um, this was a rewatch because I did my last episode of the best horror films of the year so far. I knew there was a reason. I love this so much. For a long time, this was my favourite of the year. I'm not sure it is anymore. I'm not sure, but it, it was. I was in awe of this when I saw it. I love The Omen, and I think that to have a franchise that started in the 70s and then quality just dipped off until it was a made-for-TV film that some people don't even know exists, to bring it back like two decades after the last one. This is how you sequel, requel, prequel, reboot. This is how you bring a franchise back from the dead. This is what other franchises, people wanting to do installments in other franchises should look at this and take notes because this is how you do it well. This is a film that fits with The Omen. You could beautifully watch this one and then The Omen after. Or if you wanted to just have a self-contained film, you can also just watch this on its own. You don't have to, <clears throat> excuse me, have seen the first one. I think enough is explained at the end of this that you can just watch it for its own merit. And it blows my mind that this is a directorial debut. Our Kesha Stevenson has the most beautiful eye for shots and colours and camera work and the warmth that comes across from this film at like the heat of Rome. It's just beautiful. It just blows my mind. I cannot wait to see what else they do. It's just remarkable. And the performance by Nell Tiger Free, because the cast in this is also fantastic. Nell Tiger Free is spectacular in this, such a physical and emotional performance. Um, but also Ralph Innocent as Father Brennan. He's one of my favourite characters from the franchise. And I think that this was an inspired casting choice because there is enough of Patrick Troughton uh, in the character but Ralph Innocent is also doing his own thing. Um, but I gave this four out of five stars and a half. Okay, then I rewatched Immaculate. Again, another religious horror from this year. I loved this film as well. The imagery in this film just stayed with me so much after the first watch. There's something so fascinating about the imagery and iconography from religion, especially Catholicism. It's just... I think it's a dream to make a movie with because the costuming, just the the architecture, the history, the lot, there's just so much to play around with. I don't mind religious horror movies, I quite enjoy them. And I think that to say that Immaculate was released to be the challenge to the first Omen, I think that they both work enough in their own right. Immaculate is the other side of the coin to the first omen. They're similar enough, but different enough to warrant both existing. And I think that the story itself is pretty decent. I've heard some say they wished it was fleshed out a little bit more, but I think for me, you know as much as Sydney Sweeney's character does and you discover as much as she does and that makes it more scary because it puts you in the shoes of this character and you sympathize with them you're on this journey with them you're as confused about the situation as they are and I think that that's a really clever creative choice and also talking to Sydney Sweeney like Nell Tiger Free in The First Omen she gives a remarkable performance both emotional and physical and I would say that Sydney Sweeney has more of a physical performance in this one she really pushes herself in some of the scenes that she has to do and this was my first um, experience with her as an actor and I was so impressed with just how much uh, she throws herself into it like how far that she pushes herself especially in the last act in the last third. Okay, then we have Batman Begins from 2005. This is the first installment in the Christopher Nolan trilogy. After having watched the third one, uh, I got the bug and I wanted to watch all of them. I also went to this Batman event uh, called Batman Unmasked and it's celebrating 85 years of Batman and they shipped over to the UK loads of stuff from the Batman movies. So like the Tumblr Batmobile was there, all the Batman masks were there. Most of the Batman suits were there. Michael Keaton's was, Robert Pattinson's. Um, his bike from the Batman as well was there. You had loads of gadgets. Like, oh my God, my favourite was they had the little uh, back card, back credit card from Batman and Robin. It's so bad. And they had loads of villain stuff there as well. They had Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy. They had um, the Joker from the Joker, like Whacking Phoenix's Joker. They also had uh, Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. They had Heath Ledger's The Joker's nurse outfit. 
Uh, what else do they have? They had the penguin from The Batman. They had Bane's mask and Scarecrow's mask from the Nolan trilogy. It was just such a, an incredible thing. And so having seen the film and gone to this event, I then wanted to watch the rest of the trilogy. I think that this is one of the most interesting portrayals of the origin story. If you're a Batman fan, you know, we all know it to death by now. And I think that this is a really nice way to make it that little bit different as well, a little bit fresher. The location of filming in Iceland, I mean, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? It's it's just such a good choice. Christian Bale is an incredible Bruce Wayne and Batman. I know some people don't like him as Batman. I think he is remarkable. It has, again, a complex villain in it, like Bane, Ra's al Ghul has. It kind of lives in that gray area. You know, he is what Bruce Wayne would be if he didn't have morals, compassion and boundaries. Because he wants the same thing. He wants corruption off the streets. He wants the bad guys off the streets. But he's not willing to believe that Gotham is worth saving, that there's anyone in Gotham worth saving, whereas Bruce does. So Ra's al Ghul is there to be the other side, like the mirror image of Bruce, but gone bad. And I like that because it's showing, look, here's what this character could be if he wasn't a good guy. Like if he didn't have compassion for people and hope in people as well. But yeah, five out of five stars and a half for me. Absolutely love this one. Oh, and also I did put in my review, like Killian Murphy, he's just a wonder in terms of his performance. Everyone in these films is delivering, but Killian Murphy is just, he's so subdued and controlled as a performer. He's very much like Tom Hardy in that sense and someone who can just deliver so much in such a controlled way, it's, it's just remarkable. Then I watched The Dark Knight from 2008. This is my least favorite in the trilogy. I feel like this one has the most flaws in it in terms of like practicality of how Joker does some of the stuff that he does, but also things like there's this moment where they're trying to evacuate the hotel, the hotel, the hospital, because a character is in it and is in danger and they evacuate everyone but that character. It's like, that's the reason you're evacuating it. But you know, they're just little niggly things. This is still a five star film to me in a five star trilogy. And Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker is, I mean, you know, if you're a fan of it, if you've seen it, you know, we all praise it, but it is mesmerizing. Every time he was on the screen, I wasn't looking anywhere but at his performance and every little bit, every eye movement, arm movement, uh, every lick of the lips, it just, it's controlled like Tom Hardy and Killian Murphy, but in a different way. It's like controlled chaos. And man, I can still remember the day that I found out that Heath Ledger had passed away and I was devastated. It was so sad because obviously sad because he had a partner and family and a daughter that he was leaving behind. But, you know, selfishly for us as film lovers, he was such a talent that it just would have been incredible to see what else he could have given us. Um, and that was a real loss to the world, I think. But yeah, five stars, five stars and a heart. Then uh, in the last two days, I've watched four films. So these should be quite fresh to me. The next one is The Sentinel. This is from 1977. This is a religious film from the 1970s. And as someone who loves The Omen and The Exorcist, you would think that I would have loved this. And I was excited about it. Um, I'd heard about this one because it was a recommendation from Lee Winnell. I thought I would check it out. Finally, months later, I've got around to watching it. And it had all the potential for me to love it, but I couldn't because this is a film or oh, it's hard to watch in 2024. This is a very of its time film in terms of certain things it does, like choices it makes and the way it portrays certain people. And I just, it really held it back for me. There were bits that I enjoyed, um, some of the religious aspects when the horror starts happening, the story behind it, like the main plot of it, the reveal of it, is something I've never seen before. Really, really interesting. The cast in this is so bizarre as well. Um, you have Ava Gardner, like a classic golden Hollywood actor in this, but then you also have Jeff Gold. You have Jeff Goldblum in it, in a teeny tiny role, a very young Jeff Goldblum. And even two decades before Jurassic Park, he is still rocking a black shirt unbuttoned down to the waist. I, I think it's in his contract that he won't do a film unless he can do that. You also have Christopher Walken, a very, very young looking Christopher Walken in another tiny role. Um, he is the partner to Eli Wallace's detective. Eli Wallace, the bad guy from Magnificent Seven. 
he's brilliant. Um, and then the funniest one to me was Richard Dreyfus, who performed Jaws. He was in the tiniest role labeled man talking to woman on street. It's a blink and you'll miss it. And this is like, what, a year, two years before Jaws and it's kind of a, a jump. It's kind of a shift. And it's a shame because I was hoping I found another great 70s religious horror. But I gave this three stars because, oof, it was hard to watch. Hard to watch in parts. Uh, next we have Door from 1988. This is a Japanese horror film. Um, I hadn't heard of this until recently. I, I was recommended it. Checked it out on Shudder. Uh, it is not what I was expecting going in. This is not my typical Japanese horror film that I've seen. This is more horror thriller. It follows this housewife who is very reserved and is a very clean freak. You know, she's always determined to keep her apartment nice and clean. And she is harassed by nuisance phone calls, nuisance salesmen at the door. And one day she rejects a salesman who tries to come into the house and traps the guy's hand in the door. And after that, just her life just goes chaotic. It is another slow build uh, for the first two acts. The first two acts are slow build, but the tension that it builds within the second act, like how unpleasant and nasty things get for this housewife is really good. And then in the third act, it's just like everything is let loose then and we have body horror and we have gore and we just have this incredible, incredibly structured chase scene. You know the aerial shot in Midsummer, where, or Midsummer, uh, where Florence Pugh goes from a room and then it trans transitions into the bathroom of a, an aeroplane, but it's an aerial shot. There's another one in Malignant as well, uh, which follows through rooms. There's one like that in this one. Um, it's so fun to think of the choreography for this, of how they had to time everything right, because it just goes on forever, but it's so, so good. Um, highly recommend checking it out. Like all J-horror, there is commentary in it as well, sort of like invasion into our lives and what would you do if your home, your safe space, just wasn't that anymore. Uh, I would highly recommend checking it out. Okay, then we have another Japanese horror, One Cut of the Dead from 2017. Uh, this one was sort of a recommendation from Mike Flanagan. So I put this in my watch list ages ago, finally got around to watching it. Again, it's on Shudder. Um, <laughs> Okay, so this one's an interesting one. So I gave this one four stars and I did really enjoy it. And I have seen on Letterboxd that many other people really love this film. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about it because this like oddity, I think you need to go into blind and just enjoy. But I will give you a heads up that when you're watching the first 35 minutes, you'll probably be thinking, no, I guarantee you will be thinking what is everybody on about? What does everybody love about this film? This is not good. It's a slog to get through the first 35 minutes, but then everything makes sense. And when it makes sense, and the, the final 35 minutes of the film, it's so worth it. The The ending of this film, like the last act of this film is so good. And then the final film for this month is Predator from 1987. I watched this one because I've revisited the Alien franchise. It's one of my favourite horror franchises. And while I've seen the AVP films, I've never seen Predator films. So I promised myself that I was going to go through the Predator films. And I started off with this one. I really liked it. It's not as good as the Alien franchise for me. I think that's just always going to be my favourite. But Arnie gives such an incredible performance in this. To say this is all sort of like baby oil greased muscles and things like that, there's some genuinely good acting in this. For an 80s action film, there is more going on here than you think. There's actually quite a lot of interesting imagery and dialogue in terms of stripping the soldier facade away and reminding you that these men are men underneath their friends, their sons, their, you know, whatever. And so there's a lot of imagery of stripping that masculinity back, of that label back. Um, there's literally moments where people, you know, go off to fight the predator and they take their soldier uniform off. So they're, they're just them, they're just a human. And I really, really liked that as well. Um, some of the characters in this 
and not likable, but then redeemed. And there are some really likable characters, including Dutch. I think that this is a character with a really good moral compass and makes some really good decisions in the film as well. Uh, the action sequences just go wild at times and they're, I mean, my God, the kills and the body horror in this, there's limbs flying everywhere and spines been ripped out of bodies. But yeah, I enjoyed this one. I'm really looking forward to watching the second one. I know it's not meant to be as good, but that one has Bill Paxton in and I'm a big fan of his. Um, it's a shame Arnie's not going to be in anymore. I would have liked to see more of him and his character, but yeah, good time with this one. Okay, so in terms of TV, um, I started watching The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, I believe it's called. Uh, I was reading Total Film and they were behind the scenes on the season two of it and it sounded really interesting. I do like The Lord of the Rings films. Um, I don't, you know, watch a whole lot of fantasy, but I do quite like it. I do think The Lord of the Rings ones were well made. I prefer them to The Hobbit trilogy. Uh, the first season is on Prime Video or Amazon Prime and I watched perhaps the first two episodes or the first three episodes, I can't remember, but I liked it so far. I'm going to continue with it. I think there are only eight or ten in a season and then the second one is coming out now as well. So it goes way before, it's like a prequel to The Lord of the Rings and apparently the plan is that they're going to have five seasons. The end of it then basically starts where the Lord of the Rings picks up. That is according uh, to the creators of it. The casting in it is pretty good. We have characters in it who we recognise from the Lord of the Rings and we have new characters. Some are from the world of um, Tolkien's writing, some are just creations for the series. But the, the setting is beautiful. The first season is done in New Zealand, so it's just gorgeous. The second season is apparently done in England in a lot of woodland so I'm looking forward to seeing that as well but yeah giving that a go um, I quite enjoyed it so we'll see how that goes. Uh, the other thing that I'm watching is Emily in Paris. Now don't laugh because it, it I'm as surprised as anyone that I'm watching this but I finished my rewatch of Gilmore Girls. I started months ago. I mentioned it in one of these recaps. I finally finished it and I like to have something that I can put on in the background that just, you know when you're working all day and you're watching all these dark content things, I like to watch something that's a little lighter in content and doesn't make my brain work as much. And I saw the trailer for the fourth season, which obviously had spoilers in, but I was like, that looks kind of pretty. Set in Paris, I'll give that a go. And I think I binge watched about six episodes one weekend morning when I got woken up at five o'clock. Um, and then I'm now in season three. I've been watching them. They're very short. They're like 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I've been watching them, just having them on in the background. Um, okay, so here's the thing. The reality is not realistic. The clothes are really wild. The dialogue is strange at times. It's very much like in the Sex and the City thing. You know like how Carrie Bradshaw wrote one column for a newspaper a week and she somehow managed to buy Manola Blonix and eat out every single day, three times a day and live in this apartment in New York. It's that kind of realism. But the way that it makes Paris a character like Sex and the City made New York a character. It makes you fall in love with the city, it makes you want to go to the city, it really highlights how beautiful it is and it's very honest and self-aware about how Paris is marketed as the most romantic city in the world and you know that you know you've got to think of the reality behind it but it's saying Paris can be this magical place if you're willing to see the magic in it. And I quite like that. It is, you know, it's more digestible. It's easy to just put on and kick back with. Okay, so to finish off, because I have already been talking for far too long, let's do my pick of the month. Now, usually I go a little wild with these and pick about five or six. With this one, I am just picking three. And so my pick of the month for August will be Alien Romulus, Oddity, and the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. <laughs> okay, so I snuck in three in one, sue me, but those are the ones that I would highly, highly recommend you check out. Well, that is my wrap up of August. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know your favorites of the month of August as well. I'd love to get new recommendations and let me know any thoughts you have on the films I watched as well. If you're new here, then please do give this video a like and subscribe so you can join the What The Horror family and don't miss out on future content. And if you would like to join this list of names here and get extra content every single
single week and support the channel as well, then there is a link to my Patreon page in the description box below. I am doing a reshuffle of my Patreon page as in what you get in each tier. Each tier has now uh, more content, access to more content than it previously did because I just want to make sure that everybody is getting plenty for their money basically. So um, I will leave images here to what you can get in each tier. That is including the bottom tier of $2. You now get two lots of extra content more and the same for every other tier. So check that out here or go check it out on my Patreon page. And like I said, there is a link if you want to join in the description box below. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode.